thanks to all three of you for being here. Uh, Ten years or so ago, when I started talking about the demographic impact on food, which is highly predictable, mm -hmm. and the doubling of world food need in a relatively short period of time, and I was talking to somebody who runs one of our big agricultural companies, and I say, how do, can we do this? And his answer is, yes, we can do it, but we can't do it without science, and we can't do it without Africa. Uh, that that incredible population growth in Africa, that it, but what all three of you are saying, the importance of um, Africa producing more of its own food and us helping figure out how to do that is critical. I do think at this moment, this immediate $5 billion, frankly, is going to go pretty fast mm -hmm. uh, and go fast to meet the, the, the crisis need. I, let, Governor, you said you bought a lot of, Governor Beasley, you buy a lot of food from Ukraine. What happens as the Russians move across southern Ukraine? They've almost destroyed Maripol, if not, and probably the port at Maripol, I don't know, but they're now focusing on Odessa. What happens, one, to the rest of the world if those ports are not operational for some period of time? And then two, what do you think happens to Ukraine uh, and the food they maybe would be able to still continue to grow if those ports aren't available to them or to anybody else, perhaps. I guess you could actually say goodbye to Ukraine if you don't get those ports open because the economy collapses. Forty or more percent of their GDP is based upon agricultural products that are exported through those ports. So it's critical. And then you talk about the impact that it'll have on global food security, famines around the world, the pricing that we're already seeing spiking. And so over the next eight to 12 months, you'll be, you'll see continued pricing spikes. And here's what's very frightening. When you look at uh, Arab Spring in 2011, 2012, the economic indicators now are worse than they were in Arab Spring. Because we see food pricing and what it what it leads to from migration to riots to protests to destabilization. Just in the past few weeks, you've seen Sri Lanka, uh, Indonesia, Pakistan, Peru. Uh, in the last few months, you saw Chad, of course, in Burkina Faso and Mali. And so it will only get worse in these places if food uh, prices continue to spike, and they will because you don't have the availability of $400 million. $400 million, uh, when you, Ukraine feeds 400 million people with the food. So if that's out of the equation, where is that going to come from? You can't make that up that fast. So it creates tremendous market volatility. And then you compound that with the fertilizer problem. And uh, like Ethiopia and Sudan, 85% of their fertilizer comes from uh, Russia, Belarus. Mm -hmm. And they are already in very, very... Uh, fragile states. That's just two. And I can go from country. To but without those country. ports, could Ukraine, even if it could grow the food, how would the, how would they get the food? How would you get the food out of you? You can't, you can't get enough food out uh, to try to truck it out. Uh, for example, when an average day at the ports is 3000, give or take uh, train car loads per day. And the average train car load is three to four trucks. So do the math. That would be at least 10,000 trucks per day. And it's not a one-day trip. It's several days. So you could talk about four to five days worth of trucking operations, 50,000 trucks. Uh, what we have in, in sitting down with the Ukrainian government, a best-case scenario is you could truck and train out about a, uh, 1 million metric tons a month. Now, the problem with that, and that's not much compared to how much they produce. It's a drop in the bucket. But the problem with that is pricing spikes with that because the cost of transportation will move it up to $120 more per ton, which prices it out of the market. Right, right. Let me, I, let me ask one more question here. You said, and, and I think Ms. McKenna has also said, we need to move fast. What can we do to speed up our efforts through you, through U.S., uh, through uh, USAID, uh, are there element? Are there tools we can better use to get this done quicker? And I want to go next to Miss McKenna and ask her if the if the NGOs uh, have the capacity to do more if we'll work in a better way. But uh, David, you want to answer that? Yeah, I do. I, I think there are several things. I think first and foremost, I think encouragement to uh, USAID from the Senate and the House of move these funds quickly. I think 
they're in a lot of pressure. You've got lawyers and all the bureaucracy, and I think as much encouragement as we can do down to USAID, that would be very important. Number two, uh, in the past, we have mechanisms that we can put in place, that we have in place ready to move quickly funds. I mean, cash-based transfer, we can move just like that. IRA accounts and major tranches for regional uh, areas of the world, we can move these funds very quickly. We have the capacity to handle such, and then we can move uh, funds with our partners uh, as, as, as quickly as possible. But I think it's going to take a lot of encouragement uh, uh, down the street. Ms. McKenna? Yeah. Yes, thank you for that question. We would encourage USAID to really work with um, NGOs to move the quickly, obviously, but also really leveraging NGOs and leveraging existing relationships they have to do things like creating cash consortiums um, that can be used in, in multiple markets around the world, like Yemen or Syria, to kind of support local markets um, while also supporting food production and other things. So we saw them able to do that a bit with COVID, being able to top up existing awards to support that, and we would encourage them to look at that again. Well, thank you, and I had a whole lot of other questions if the chairman hadn't returned, but he's back. And uh, No, go right ahead, chairman. Uh, we have no other members currently, and I know we have two on their way back. Well, from the African uh, bank point of view, what, what do we, again, the key points to one, get food out quickly, and two, to encourage more production. Um, thank you very much, uh, Senator. If you're back to your point, you were saying earlier on was an excellent point on the importance of R&D, science matters. Um, and I just want to make two, two, two examples of that. One is in Africa today, we have actually supported what is called the water efficient maize for Africa, which is a very, very drought tolerant maize variety. Uh, interestingly, I was at that time an associate director at the Rockefeller Foundation, and I was based in Zimbabwe, uh, where we actually supported the uh, Global Center for Wheat and Maize Cement, based in Mexico, to develop those varieties. And those varieties worked. When we had drought um, in East and Southern Africa in 2018, 2019, the African Development Bank, through this program that I mentioned to you called Technologies for African Agricultural Transformation, we actually got those water efficient maize varieties out to 5.2 million households. And that's why we were able to avoid a food crisis there. The second one is about wheat. As we all know, wheat is a temperate crop, but with technology right now, we actually have heat tolerant wheat varieties. And the African Development Bank was able to provide the case, basically was talking about the case of Sudan and also Ethiopia. And we provided for Ethiopia, I mean Sudan, 65,000 metric tons of certified seed of these heat tolerant varieties. And that is about the equivalent. If one takes an Airbus uh, 380 in terms of passenger cargo and fuel, we have about 90, 90, uh, 94 uh, metric tons of 98.2 or so metric tons. So we're talking about almost 665 A380 Airbus of seed provided for that. And that allowed them to reduce their import of wheat. Uh, most of you, of course, you know, come from Russia and all of those places by 50%. We did the same also for Ethiopia, where today they were cultivating in 2018 to 5,000 hectares of heterogeneous varieties. They've gone to 400,000 hectares of that today. So technology actually does matter. And in terms of, you know, the issue of getting things out, I think just to add to what Jada was saying and also David, is I think that we should get it to what's working on the ground. Come back to what Senator um, Graham was saying, produce food in your backyard, you know, and we have TAT, uh, which actually brings together the global R&D centers, the, the, the national centers, the regional centers, the private R&D centers to actually get technologies to agricultural value chains all across Africa. So put the money what it is working on the ground. The plan that we have put forward here, distinguished senators, it's not one we develop in our offices. It's one that's actually developed from the countries, over 40 countries where we have been impacting them in terms of access to climate resilient technologies. So one of the things we can do with this money, given also that uh, uh, the, 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 the administration, U.S. administration is big on climate, as, we, as much as we are big on climate, is to make sure that the money is used for food, but also wins on climate. So we can win on food, but we also have to win on climate, and R&D is the best way. And we have the best way of getting these technologies out, I would say, is the mobile phones. We can register, we have to register farmers biometrically, give them access to technologies 
and give them via their mobile phones and send them money by mobile phones. That way we make sure there's inclusiveness, in particular that women have to be carried along. I continue to say that because you have to make sure that women participate and benefit from this because they are the majority. I've done this when I was Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria. We got all the farmers registered on mobile phones. We put them on a digital databases and we send them money by vouchers on their, on their, on their, uh, on their mobile phones. And I remember walking into one perimeter one day, the farmer told me, the woman farmer there said, well, thank you, Minister. Now we get seeds and fertilizers in our villages and the men cannot cheat us anymore. We've got to bring transparency, transparency and accountability and inclusiveness to the way in which these funds are deployed for impact. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman.